Look at them reaching out saying, hey, look at this cool box. Uh, what are they running, Linux? Yeah. Uh, what, though? Uh, Ubuntu. Look at that. 100, 100% open source. So it's got an Odroid uh, 1.7 gigahertz U3 quad-core processor powered by Ubuntu full specs. Let's go check that out. So it's imp.computer. Two gigs of RAM, eight gigabytes of storage on board, Ubuntu 14.04, and Cinnamon, Chrome and Firefox. Interesting. They say Office. They say, uh, oh, oh, look at look, this. Is that. Office, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, online, Google Docs, yeah. Apple, and iCloud. Screenshot. I, I think it's like Chromebook style Chromebox yeah. kind of thing. But it also talks about being a media hub. It's pretty interesting. So, are they doing? They're doing a, a fundraiser. Yeah, they're going to do one. They haven't said when. Continuity. Imp supports full continuity. Now you can pick up any task you were doing, or move your, or move what you're watching on your mobile, and then continue it on your desktop. Hmm. It looks about the size of a NUC, only even maybe a bit smaller. I bet. Will yeah. It? Well, if you look at the size of an Odroid, they're they're quite yeah. tiny. So. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense, huh? And it looks like they're mm. going to uh, tie in with uh, some sort of app that you can use on Android, iOS, or Windows. Interesting. Good find, Popey. I wonder if maybe somebody in this room has heard of this new, uh, this new TrueCrypt uh, remake that's called, it's better than TrueCrypt, it's called Veracrypt. Uh, it's like an alternative. They say that they've gone in and cleaned a few things up, fixed a few problems. Anybody heard of it? Anybody trust it? Anybody found I've a good heard TrueCrypt? Of it. I ran across the story yesterday, and... I don't know what to think about it. Yeah, I don't know if I can trust it yet. Like, what does it take to trust something? What did it take to get me to trust TrueCrypt? It'd just been around a while, I guess. Edward Snowden. Do you know if the <laughs> audit that was being done on um, TrueCrypt is going to publish their findings at some well, point? Well, they've, they've published the first phase, and now they're like, I thought that we were. I thought we were supposed to see the second phase. By well, now. this is this is what I'm referring to. Is the is the follow up? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we've seen that, and it kind of uh, nobody's really talked about it since the project shut down. No, and I think until we see that, we can't say for any certainty whether we trust anything that's right. derived you from You know, it. that must be it. Because, like, what if there's a fundamental flaw in there? Now, now that now that they've they like they gave up like this, it's that whole thing is still very unsettling. Like, I don't really understand what happened there, and I don't know. And and now looking back, it's so weird. Like all the things that have happened since TrueCrypt uh, uh, threw in the hat. Like that's been that was before, that was pre Heartbleed, that was pre Shell Shock, and. All these, all these essential open source utilities have had these vulnerabilities in them now. Makes you wonder what the state of uh, TrueCrypt really is. And so, if is anything based off it, you know, that's the other thing. Is remember the developers said, "Don't base your future stuff off ours. Just start from new code." Quiet. Yeah, that's another risk. That you, I, that's weird when the developer says, "Yeah, I don't. You don't want to use what no. I know." So that's the, the, the I, I realize. I realize why they said it. They said it because when blood. you start going and no, no, well, that one thing. But to go into to. Take something and then try and slap things on top of it. Yeah. As soon as you start slapping things on top, that's just yeah. another point where you can yeah. poke at. Yeah, you end up with a Windows release. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. No, <laughs> nobody wants that. <laughs> Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's powered by a cup of coffee and two energy drinks. My name is Chris. <laughs> my name is Matt. I might have a heart attack during today's show, Matt. So if you hear something that sounds like my face smacking into the microphone, just spring into action. Make sure you close out the show and remind people about all the stuff I always remind people about. And then we'll just we'll clean up the mess later, okay? Because Sounds good. There doesn't even have to be a video show in here until Thursday. So if you think about it, if I'm dead, you got time. Don't even rush down. You can just get down here and clean me up when you get a chance, okay? There you go. Thanks. I think if we can get past the bloat and I get a hand truck in there, I think we're okay, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and actually, it'd be a good time, too, because I just got uh, the new Borderlands uh, prequel. Just came out for Linux this morning installed, so I'll have that up on my machine. So you can just play that when you get here, so it's worth the trip, too. There you go. So you're welcome. Nice. Yeah. All right, well, coming up on today's episode, uh, we've got a couple of topics that I want to throw in everybody's faces to get some discussion going. Not only do we get some great emails, which I think will get us going on a few things, uh, I'm really looking forward to that. I want to talk about some of the next generation apps coming to Ubuntu that we got a sneak peek at today. And then we've heard a lot of times it's hard to develop applications for Linux. It's too fragmented. It's changing too much. How do you write for an operating system that's constantly changing underneath you? Well, we actually have a real-world example of how that affected something that I think you've probably heard of before. 
it didn't all end badly, but it does give us a little perspective on some of the challenges writing a major enterprise-grade application for Linux can face. So it should be a good show. Why don't we uh, bring in the Mumble Room with us so we start off the email. Hey there, Mumble Room. Time appropriate greetings. Time for Evening. Hey. Hello. What? <laughs> I like that somebody always gets a little <laughs> that, singing yep. in there. That's good. All right. Uh, so PM right, wrote in and wanted to pick up on our discussion regarding uh, Netflix and how Linux users are all in on DRM now that Netflix is here. He says, hello, Chris, Matt, Mumble Room, chat room. I just wanted to offer my opinion on the Netflix equals Linux users are fine with DRM thing. I personally don't like DRM, and I'm certainly not all in on it, but let's be honest. The fact that Netflix now works on the desktop for Linux is a, co- is a coincidence, not an intention. Netflix, Google, etc. pushed DRM into HTML5 because they want to offer content on Roku, Android devices, etc. Because this DRM scheme is now part of HTML5, Linux users can enjoy it as well. But it wasn't put there because of us, that's for sure. Now we can do two things. We can be angry at Netflix, not watch it, And they're going to continue business as usual because, quite frankly, they don't care much about us. The DRM will still happily remain baked into HTML5 because it wasn't put there because of us in the first place. It was put there for smart TVs and set-top boxes that they'll continue to sell regardless. We as Linux users can cry all we want, but DRM is now in, and it's up to us whether we at least use it for some benefit to us, like Netflix on the desktop, or cry about it and have none of the benefit with no one listening to our cries about DRM <laughs> anyways. So nailed it. So nailed it. Oh, man. Wow. Wow, that is... Uh, that I, is, I almost stood up and applauded. <laughs> just like, it kind is of perfect. is a bit of a reality check. Eric, do you think yeah. uh, Do you think Netflix maybe uh, has a little responsibility to bear here? Uh, I think they have some responsibility, but I don't think they are the, the main reason. They've come out and said if they could skip the DRM, they would, because it's a headache on them. It's something they don't want to have to deal with. It's the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America, that is forcing this on them. So mm-hmm. it's all of the copyright holders that are forcing this on them because they don't want any chance of piracy. They say but that. They, the, say, they that. say that. But, but the, how the come, thing is, it's going to happen come, regardless. But how come House of Cards and Orange is the New Black also are still wrapped up in DRM? Netflix made those whole cloth. They own them. Yes, they, they did. they already had it. Developed so they just yeah I suppose I mean I I just whatever I mean I think PM nails it it's like it's not even for us our protests matter no n- nothing like we're just shouting into the wind because it really is more about Chromebooks and tablets and Android devices and Roku's and it is Linux users but aren't aren't, aren't all these examples Linux based anyway so inherently they are looking at it they they might not care as much right. But- Right. It's not like is, they, we just happen to luckily get it. I mean, they're using, they're focusing on devices that support Linux. Yeah, is that what you think, Wizard? You think it's like they are focusing yeah. on Linux, but it's not the desktop Linux Absolutely. user? Absolutely. They, they, they do care about Linux as a platform. They don't care about the Linux users. They, they, as far as they're concerned, they said, we need a platform that we're going to put out there. But we don't care about those users. We want the users that are going to be using our Roku, our solution on top of it. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Good point. Yeah, and you know what? This is just sort of the benefit of Linux becoming one of the general technology platforms is we get to go along for the ride sometimes. And I think that's totally fine. Yeah, and that's a good thing. My, my point is we that. need to be pointing the finger, the blame, blaming the people who deserve the blame. I think Netflix is an easy scapegoat. You're saying, Eric, show me the money. Show me the money! Yeah, that's you follow the money back to the content creators, and they're the exactly. ones pulling the strings, and yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 All right. Nathan writes in. Get ready for this one, uh, Popey and Wimpy. Uh, he has questions about a software store. He's got some ideas and some concerns. Hello, Chris, Matt, chat room, mumble room, etc. I was thinking long and hard today about Linux users and purchasing software. I know about the struggles large companies have when thinking about moving over to Linux and how there is not really a good way to get their software purchased on end users' computers. The one package for all thought comes to mind. Though it isn't exactly easy to get distros on board, especially when you don't have a track record of anything like this really working that well at all. So I was thinking about these software stores. Something could almost be like the way the AUR works, where the front end knows how to build the program for that specific distribution, and you as the user just have to click download and install, and the app store in the background does the building. From there, all you have to do is get the payment system working and you're off to the races. Since compiling applications between distro is more or less the same, everyone could just follow tar.gz instructions, a software store could just do all of the work on the back end for you. So this leads me to my question. If you were to make a software store, 
What would you do to help this process go smoothly? This type of store will only gain traction and help the Linux desktop if it worked across distros, so let's keep that in mind when discussing this. Also, I'm a Mac guy. I love Linux, but I only know so much, so maybe I'm completely off on this concept. But as a Mac user, he seems like this is something we need. So I wanted to start uh, with uh, Popey and Wimpy because you guys were sort of kicking around some ideas of what could work for an app store. And I know you guys definitely weren't thinking something that builds software, and I don't even think you were thinking something cross-distro. Uh, well, in fact, it's quite interesting that the uh, the way he describes how a store should work, that the back end builds the software and then you just click a button and download a binary. That is exactly what the Ubuntu Software Center does. It, it builds it in a PPA. They're private PPAs. And when you buy a piece of software, you are allowed access to a private PPA where that software was built and it downloads to your machine. So I think he's talking about argue, compiling, it's only for though, right? one. Yeah, and yeah. it does that. Oh, okay. It does that. Okay. So that 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 bit, yeah, he's got that completely nailed. But what he's talking about is building for like multiple platforms. So you have one store where you click a button and it figures out that you yeah. want Fedora. So it build it builds and gives you an RPM. That that would all be magical. Getting buy in from everyone, tricky. <laughs> that that's harder. You think so? It seems to me that uh, it it would almost be in a sense the burden would be on the software center or whatever you want to call it to figure out that magic, but it well, frees again, developers again, up. It depends whether you're talking about um, free software, open source software, or um, proprietary software, because some developers want to put their free and open software, and okay, the build it in the cloud and download works for that, but what about those developers who are writing proprietary software? So the, 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 the individual developers or the app developers who are creating applications, they will build it locally on their machine and then upload a binary. So it doesn't um, work for every use case. Well, I'm also now thinking of the OpenSUSE build service, right, where it builds yeah. that. Uh, go right. ahead. Go ahead, Wimpy. Well, yeah, I was just going to say the build from source uh, idea is, is fine, but you would need somebody to actually put the effort in to create the packaging for the different end distributions. So I have some experience in packaging on Arch Linux, Debian and Ubuntu, uh, and I can't directly take my packaging from Arch and apply it in uh, deb files because the concepts are totally different from one another. So you have to do whole cloth implementations and the packaging for each distribution separately and also ah. spec files from RB RPMs are different to DEBs and different to Arch PKG builds. So you could build it from source but somebody would have to be the package maintainer for all of the things. This that is why is I right. think the, the way that we've done it with the phone, which is the developer builds it and they upload a binary is the better way forward because then you make as you as a developer make sure that your thing works and if it works and you can build it locally and you can test it in an emulator or test it on your device or desktop or whatever and then once you've built a, a, a compiled version you upload that into the store and make that available to people so uh io go go uh you mentioned the magic docker word that seems to be the the buzz uh phrase that everybody uses to solve problems like this what what what, what were you thinking in terms of how docker could solve this well, I, from what I've read in places, that I fi I've heard that Docker basically emulates um, distros on top of um, on top of an existing software or kernel, and the, but you could use you, you could do, um, companies could use that to. I can't talk with this echo. So you're thinking <laughs> you're thinking that like uh, companies could develop to deliver their applications. Close your mic. And I'll, I'll, I'll summarize. You're thinking people could develop, could deliver their applications through Docker, and they are kind of starting to do that. Like I deployed SmokePing on my Arch setup over that, and I I found it to be really simple and straightforward. And of course, it means I'm kind of running an Ubuntu machine in a container, and that that makes me go back. Do to you that. make that sound bad? Well, no. <laughs> you're like, oh god, I'm running an Ubuntu in a container. Oh, god. No, it just. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it seems like it seems like a lot of extra overhead to run a single application. Like a lot of extra stuff has to be updated and maintained now. But but, but it, in the long run, I'm, no, I'm not convinced it's not. It might be better. Um, no, I mean like um, well, I mean like um, build it in a Docker container and then you give out the binaries from the Docker container and like you have different distros in the Docker containers. Hmm. With all the you still thousands have to the of packaging. gigabytes of storage that yeah. need to be on the server side for these companies in order to get all the combination of phones fixed and figured out and it relatively bug free either they can do it and host 50 different binaries for 50 different things that they know should cover most phones it's very hard to go and just give the software store the source 
then you can use your phone to chug through it and compile it straight up on your phone because you're going to need some serious power cord usage after that. Otherwise, like they need to make sure that all these programs, apps, are compiled for their target operating system in a runtime environment. And in order to get all that, it's a lot of space used up on their servers. Uh, Rotten, I want to hear your grand vision of one app store to solve all, because this is exactly what Nathan's going after. What do you think? Yeah, a universal app store for Linux would be the perfect option because it would be a set up a structure more in the sense that every single app, every single distro can keep doing whatever they want to do. They can use RPM, they can use Deb or whatever. And this software center or store or whatever just gives you the packages that are for your distro. And it, based on what is installed to, it can tell what distro it has. So it knows what packages to give you. So it'll give you an RPM if you need RPM, Deb if you're on Debian, stuff like that. I don't know. So, I, I I feel like I feel like this problem is already solved uh, by our friends over at Valve. I mean, we all have different distributions. All of us have Steam installed. We're all downloading, and installing applications. They don't have to only deliver uh, desktop games. They could also deliver desktop productivity applications. They already have some in their store. Well, they do. Right. But, and they do. They do what I suggested, which is the developer uploads a binary. They don't build it in Steam. Right. The developer builds the binaries and uploads a Windows binary, a Mac binary, a Linux 32-bit binary. And and that works. So we have, we have I see in front of us, we have Lenart and the Gnome team's version of distributing software through uh, like a ButterFS, uh, you know, a, a Delta uh, you have delivering applications through Docker. You have delivering applications through an App Store, Steam, the OpenSUSE build service. Obviously, I think it's pretty clear that even though this is not, th we're working towards something, and we just haven't, we still haven't figured out what it is. It's it's kind of it is it's kind of crazy. It kind of is over the top, uh, but I feel like we're getting somewhere, and I I kind of feel like containerization and all this stuff is almost going to maybe start nullifying all these differences, and we we might look back at a time where developers and package maintainers know what all of these little things are but it's been pretty well abstracted away from the end user so i Steam that's my vision obs would be awesome my my long-term vision is distros will keep their distro specific tools that they use to manage their software and build their distribution but long term it's it's almost abstracted away from the user in all cases i mean you see it you see it today where uh now the gnome software center it's the same way to install um transmit on fedora as it is on arch now and they are Hugely different under the hood in terms of installing packages, but that's ginormous, right? And that's one instance of it, and that's maybe just a little glimpse into the future. I don't know. I just really, really think it's going to change eventually. It has to change eventually, I think, because it, it's something that does forward, keep coming. You're moving up. backward. Well, and it's something that seems to be. It's something that never goes away, especially when people switch to Linux. So it's always an email that's coming in our inbox because people are switching over to Linux and they're like, "What a mess!" You know, because on on Windows and Mac. When you want to download something, even though it's a little more archaic than how we do it, to the end users, it makes a lot of sense. You Google the name of the thing, Skype. You click on the Skype download Google result. It's like the second or third result, right, every time. You download it to your desktop, and you double-click it. And that's how they think software is supposed to work. And so the, the idea to them that you download something for Linux, and it could work on one Linux and not work on another Linux... That's broken to them. That that is that is fundamentally flawed. That's a flaw to them, and I I can see it that way. So I think eventually it's going to have to be abstracted out. Something smarter is going to have to happen. Well, and you say that you say that it's archaic, but the I mean the reality is if all the software existed in every software repository, I would agree with you. But since it doesn't, I depending on which distro I'm using, drastically it varies. Yeah, it can still but, happen. Yeah, I mean it it drastically depends on what software is available to me, right? But I what I mean like uh, they get all their software that way. Right for Linux yeah. users, we have in repos we can download it. But for them, like they go hunt and peck and download from the web, and that's why sometimes they download the wrong thing and they get malware. Like it's not a safe, like what they call like trying to get printer drivers for uh, for uh, for something that yeah, it's just it's very, it's very it's very different than how you do it under Linux. And to them, it's totally it doesn't make any sense how you do it under Linux, how you install software. Like I you know I specifically I know I've mentioned this a lot, but you know watching Chase try to install a few applications for the first time on Ubuntu. And and other people I've had try it too. Like every time I tell them, okay, now let's install some software, even though I intentionally kind of introduce them to the software center and then close it and make sure we move on and say, okay, now let's install some software. I swear every time they open up the browser and they go to Google. They don't even think well, think about it. They don't even think about packages. 
No, they don't. I think you're also com- um, combating muscle memory. You know, people have it wired into mm-hmm. their. It's like you know, p- people that are analytical, they're dealt with a certain situation, they instantly go into solving mode. You know, um, whereas someone else just goes into freakout mode. I-, I think it's the same sort of thing. These people have been wired to find software in this fashion, and you're having to unlearn yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And, and it may take it's all time. training. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. You can teach. Yeah. Trust me. You can teach an old dog new tricks. Hey, speaking of new tricks, let me tell you about DigitalOcean. They got a few new tricks I'd like to tell you about. Oh, you're not familiar with DigitalOcean, my friends? Now is the time to go to DigitalOcean.com because we've got a promo code for the month of October that'll get you a $10 credit. Hey, oh, unplugged October, all one word, lowercase, $10 credit. So what is DigitalOcean? Mm, it's like a warm cloud blanket. You just want to wrap up it and you set up all kinds of droplets because it's a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can get started in less than 55 seconds, trust me. And pricing plans start at only $5 a month for 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer for $5. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and up in London. Why not get some global diversity? That's what I always say. In fact, I, I've been doing that. Um, I actually have done it just for performance purposes because we have a lot of folks that are syncing to some of our resources from you know other, other parts of the world. So I thought, okay, let's have a server in their area. That just makes sense. But then I later realized, hey, I just distributed my data across the world and now I have regional backups. That's great. So it, it's also great from that standpoint as well. So you can, you can do it for performance or for data purposes. And I think the other thing that's really awesome about DigitalOcean is I know that because their interface is so great, I can really get up and get something running in pretty much no time. So getting the server part ready, spun up, backed up, whatever I need to do before a project, DigitalOcean makes that crazy easy. So that's never the barrier to getting started, which I really appreciate because their interface is super simple and intuitive. And you can replicate the functionality on a larger scale with their API. But something new DigitalOcean is doing. Now it's your chance to make a little cash on the side. If you're an expert in something, you want to deploy, if you've deployed something and you want to write a tutorial for it, DigitalOcean can pay up to $200 for your tutorial. And they have editors that will work with you, so don't worry, the burden's not all on your shoulders. They just need somebody that really knows their stuff because DigitalOcean wants to get their community tutorials beyond anything else that anybody else has. And that's why they're willing to pay the, the good, the good I, I, 200 bucks. That's, that's some good yeah, money that's, for that's, writing. That's, yeah, that's actually um, in most circles for you know just a standard uh, article. It's outlining how to do something. That's the going rate. That's not bad, that is, right? I mean, a, especially if it's something you already know. Yeah, if it's something you already know. And you know exactly. what I would have done, Matt, is I I, I think like it, it, even even like even if I already had like if just if I just wanted a little play money, I mean I could I could take yeah. that I could take those cre- I could take that take those as credits or something, put them on my DigitalOcean account, and have my droplet pay for for a long time because they're talking it's five dollars a month. But even if I oh, I kind of kick myself because I think I probably I probably could have taken advantage of this when I first deployed OwnCloud Seven. I was I had that up and running oh. the night it came out, and then I had a whole bunch of people asking me how I got OwnCloud Seven running, and I thought I you know what. I could have written that up, worked with one of the DigitalOcean editors, and potentially made two hundred dollars. So I have a link in the show notes if you want to find out more information about that. It's an initiative that DigitalOcean is really excited about because they're trying to get that just better than anybody. They've already got amazing tutorials, a great community. Now they're trying to make it better than ever. DigitalOcean.com. Check them out. Unplugged October will get you that ten dollar credit. Find out why Matt and I have got like droplets coming out of our ears these days. <laughs> well, and just to touch on that whole writing thing one more time, uh, what I'm saying is that most places that you go to seek out like freelance work for, you're not getting paid anywhere near that. This is unusual. This is more closer to pro it's level. It's a good pay. opportunity. I, mean, is, I know. It's a great opportunity. It's, I know, it's right? Good money. And especially, I know if people in our audience, there's stuff out there they know a lot about that definitely they can make a little, a little extra money on. All right, so we got a couple more emails that I think are really going to get us going on a couple of topics. So let me jump back into the emails here. The first email that we're going to talk about is Peter's. Uh, and he wants to know, this is a question I get all the time. He says, hey, Chris, the other day I was watching one of the episodes of Last, and you jumped into a terminal when you were installing an app. While you were using the terminal, I noticed a kind of auto-completed helper tool that would suggest your next command. I tried searching for bash in the search input field on your site, but it returned a bunch of shows where I could not easily find any mention of the tool. And if uh, you're watching... On the video version here, uh, I'll bring up my uh, I'll bring up my terminal. On the, here's a big fonts, and uh, if you'll notice, like if I type if I start typing Packer, you s- or Ping, you see how it's starting to automatically suggest uh, commands for me, and I could hit over arrow and it'll complete the command, and then it'll run a search. That is a uh, fish shell. That's the fish shell, and uh, I like it a lot. It's uh, just uh, it's just in the it's in the arch. It's in the, probably every distro package. It's in the arch 
packages too. And uh, I installed Fish a while ago because I'm a lazy person, and I, and I mostly run the same. I, I run about the same 10, 15, 20 commands on the command line over and over again. System CTL, restart Plex, uh, Pacman SYU, you know those kinds of things over and over <laughs> again. And so the nice thing about Fish is it, it not only uh, is really smart about figuring out what directory you're trying to get to. Like here, I'll show you another one uh, back on my screen here. In the mornings, uh, I'm constantly, right before I go on live, I'm downloading like an old retro tech commercial for Tech Talk Today. So a lot of times, if I just type in CD, now it's automatically suggesting the path that I might want to go to. In this case, it's Dropbox slash Jupyter Remote Host slash Today. It's a, it's a fairly lengthy path. And instead of me having to type in there, Fish Shell is saying, well, you know what? You type this one a lot because I pretty much type that every single morning. So if I hit the over arrow, it just completes that whole path for me. And then I hit enter. And I also like the way it displays my current, my, my present location, all that kind of stuff. So I know fish shell isn't the best. Any, any shells in the mumble room anybody wants to call out that you love besides bash? Any bash alternatives? I have to shell. say, Chris, I saw that one on that show, and I changed my default to fish having seen it <laughs> just for the few seconds I saw it on your It's machine. handy, right? Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. I know a lot of people like ZSH, yep. but yep. I, I like fish better. Yeah, ZSH, I think, is I also see recommended the most. Uh, and uh, I think Fish and... Uh, oh, Heaven... So Heavens, you know ZS... So Fish and ZSH are rem- are related? I'm pretty sure that uh, okay. Fish was created from ZSH. Uh, ZSH. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That makes sense. Because, uh, so you know, Fork project. shells aren't exactly the most easiest thing in the world to, you know, come up out of thin yeah, air. Yeah, so yeah. all of the Fish beauty is built on top of ZSH's awesome built-in stuff. And Fish just knew how to use ZSH. Uh, Blaster, you have a shell you like. Uh, yeah, I've come to like TCSH actually uh, for working on BS, some of the BSD servers that sure. I have access to. Very nice. Very nice. So there you go. There, there are some shells you can check out besides boring old shell shocked bash. I kid. All right, Mike writes in, and guess what Mike wants to stir the pot on? System D. But I thought it was actually a good email, so uh, we'll go into this. Not to get the whole System D discussion going again, but he says, I finally identified why I've disliked System D for so long. And now that I identified that, I'm actually okay with System D. I have a feeling that my situation also applies to many other who have disliked System D. My frust- what frustrated me the most about System D is that it had an awful product positioning, for a lack of a better term. When it first came out, it billed itself as a simple init replacement, plus a syslog replacement, plus a cron replacement, which in my mind makes it about as much sense as putting alcohol, tobacco, and firearms under a single agency. But at least I could get my head around it, and I was fine with it. But then, it started taking control of login and managing my temp mount, among other things. I became confused and frustrated. This wasn't part of the agreement. What kind of cancer is this, System D? I've since realized that even though System D still describes itself as just being an init replacement, it's actually designed to become an entire operating system layer. It wants to be in charge of everything that happens between the kernel and X11. UDEV, DBus, login, DHCP client... WPA, WPA supplicant, etc. If there's a job that runs before the display manager starts, SystemD wants to provide it. Now that I know what SystemD's true purpose is, it no longer confuses and frustrates me. In fact, I'm kind of okay with it. I could even go ahead and replace mount and FS tab for all I care. I mean, that's what it's designed to do, right? Is he right, guys? Is System Disease designed to just manage all of the things between the kernel and X? Yeah. Yeah, I think I it kind of is, too. Providing that kind yeah, of abstraction. Kinda. That's my impression. Yeah. All right, Otter, you have something to say. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say uh, this This idea has occurred to other people as well. Um, Upstart was also going to replace cron and um, auto mounting and things like that. The difference is uh, Upstart had a limited budget, whereas System D had Red Hat behind it. Well, okay, yes. I you know, uh, it's so I I I think what I want I I want to go back up. So System D, Michael Dominic on Coda Radio, uh if you haven't listened to this week's Coda Radio, it he goes after me the entire episode. And uh yeah. he got on me about System D and was really trying to get to the root of it, and one of the things that he sort of stressed was like, "Wait a minute, when you describe it, it sounds almost like some of these things are necessary." And I'll give you an example of one of the things that System D does for me on my servers that to me, feels like something that has to be in Linux for it to stay competitive. And that is that systemd manages my NFS mounts. And the reason why I find that to be important is because I've had networking issues here at the studio because of Comcast, and we reboot things like our router and even the switch just to be safe sometimes. 
and my network connections go up and down. And System D recognizes that and is intelligent enough to reestablish my NFS mount after the network connection is live again, which makes all of the server software that runs over that NFS mount continue to function without me having to do anything. Now that's handy just here having a server that never leaves the studio. But on a laptop or a phone or a tablet where you're moving between cellular and Wi-Fi and, and different Wi-Fi networks, that's a must-have critical feature. And that's just one thing that SystemD now manages that is extremely... Uh, I, I just I don't even think it's like a nice to have feature. I think it's like we got to have that now. It's got to be a, the operating system has to be be more cohesive. It has to be more intelligent. It has to be communicating with each other to stay competitive. And, and and I mean competitive in a way where like people will actually continue to use it because if it doesn't do these things, it'll start to look old and not appropriate for modern day tests. And I I recognize that we're kind of betting a lot on System D, but I don't. I don't see anybody else really... St I guess that's part of it is I don't really see any other alternatives really kind of stepping up to do the whole thing. Well, that's the key, is that nobody else is doing it, and it seems to be a great solution. It's worked for me. It's worked for a lot of people. PC oh. Wiz, you think it's more... It's not what System D does. It's how it does it. What do you mean? I think um, it's just the way we're not using standard Unix pipes and things to communicate between the different utils is mm -hmm. what's upsetting most people. Because if they just set it out like standard um, Unix utilities and used pipes to communicate between them, then I don't think people would have such a problem with it. But because it's doing its own custom thing and outputting the binary files, that's the problem people have with it. Not particularly that all this stuff shouldn't be there and shouldn't be unified under one set of things, but it should be in different bits that talk in a standard Unix way. All right, all right, very good. Now we're going to open up something special. We're all done with the system D debate. We got to talk about Ubuntu and the future and some really flashy stuff that I saw today. And I'm glad that uh, Popey is here because maybe I think uh, we'll get this straight with Popey here. We won't make it awful. Popey will save us. I'm I'm told. I'm told. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. Because I want to discuss, so we got some great visuals of the next generation apps that we'll probably be able to get our hands on in Ubuntu 14.10 just to play around with. And I want to see what you guys think. And uh, kind of get your take on, on you know, uh, if you think they're going to be, um, if you think they're going to get the job done for you, and if you're excited about them. I actually watched uh, a video, I don't know who posted it, I'll, I'll get that before we go on, uh, this morning. And uh, some of those apps are looking pretty damn good, especially the Movies and Videos app look really good. Uh, so before we get to that, I want to tell you about our next sponsor, and that's Linux Academy. Go to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged to get the 33% discount and to check out the brand new website. Man, Linux Academy just really spruced it up. Go over there just to check that out. These guys, I, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I, I got to talk to them. I got to talk to them to redesign the Jupyter Broadcasting website because I tell you, this is how you do it. I could, I could see uh, this look working for us. I could see that. So what is Linux Academy? It's probably where you should go right now if you're ready to take your Linux skills up to the next level, make yourself a little more competitive, maybe get that checkbox on the next review, or just sort of test yourself, find out what you're interested in. Linux Academy has a whole range of courses, and your subscription gets you access to all of it and all of the new stuff they're adding. DevOps stuff, AWS classes, basic Linux classes to, ex to expert level Linux classes. OpenStack, and they have seven plus distributions you get to choose from when you're taking any of these courses. The courseware will modify itself to match that distribution. They have downloadable, comprehensive study guides. You can take those offline. That includes media like audio and video files as well. I've heard from many listeners who now use those downloads as sort of like po supplemental podcasts. So when they're not listening to the shows, they get a extra learning in. And Linux Academy also has the ability to generate a learning course, a learning plan, just based on your availability. You go in there and plug in the information you've got. They'll build a plan that fits your schedule. When you open up the dashboard, you get an immediate snapshot of right where you're at, what you have, how long each section is going to take. You can do recaps. You can test yourself. You can rewatch video introductions. And if you get to a spot, you can also see constructor help. They also have an active community and live streams of events where you can talk right to the educators. They're constantly adding new stuff. A lot of these are scenario-based training courses. That way you go end-to-end -end with the technology. For example, if it's an AWS course, you'll implement things on EC2 and S3. They'll spin up the instances for you as the courseware requires it. That's really awesome. And now these servers have public addresses, so that way other people can log in and you can work in a group. It's pretty awesome stuff, and they're, they're adding new things all the time. So head over to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. 
you'll get a 33% discount. And this is a school put together by Linux enthusiasts and educators who had the know-how to do something like this, who wanted to give Linux users a spot to go and actually learn something. And not this stuff that you go to that's sort of like cookie-cutter Linux material that's been put together by some industry. This is from stuff from folks that work in the industry. They really know their stuff, and they're experienced educators. It's an experience that's custom-crafted for Linux users. And you can find it at linuxacademy.com slash unplug. Check out all of their awesome stuff. It's another great way to go if you just want to spruce up your skills. I've mentioned before they've got courseware on rsync and backup scripts, bash scripting, things like that, Android development, PHP, the entire LAMP stack, all of that. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Okay, so I, I'm not going to play a lot of this video because a lot of people listen to the show in the audio version, but Popey, I assume you've seen this, this video that was posted online, the Ubuntu Next Gen apps for 1410. Have you seen this? Nope. <laughs> yeah, I have. Okay. I've, I've, I've only briefly, I haven't actually watched the whole thing. So I've, I've just, never uh, seen like the movies app. It. This is the first time I've, I think maybe I've seen screenshots of it, but this is like the first time I've ever seen the UI resizing. And, is that flashback? Uh, I don't know. It just says movies in the title bar. Yeah, flashback. Right. Is that the name yep. of it? Flashback? Yeah. Cool. So, uh, so they, the, this is the this is the one that gets shown. Then also music gets shown quite a bit. What we're seeing is it's obviously like you know for you those of you listening. I mean, this is clearly a touch UI, uh, and that, that makes sense at this stage too. But it, right. it's fully usable on the desktop, and and the rescaling has surprising functionality on the desktop. Like there's actually like like well, I always pictured that dynamic rescaling really just for like going from phone to desktop, but it actually works really well on the desktop too just depending on where you position the window this all looks so pretty of, slick most of the apps actually in that video haven't been optimized for desktop I most imagine, of them are yeah. actually uh, tuned for phone and tablet and we're, we're not even begun to work on them for the desktop we've done the absolute minimum to get them working on the desktop and some of them actually look really good so i mean kind of what like i'm just i'm going i'm, I'm going to take an optimistic road here and i'm going to go like way down the road like you know, even maybe past 1604, but we're, we're, so we're going away down the road here, uh, is really what we would have is at this, at that point, the Ubuntu desktop is almost entirely an ecosystem of its own in terms of apps, right? So it's got, it's, it's got you presumably unity eight by that point. It's got its own terminal app. It's its own file manager, all of these things. So that's a lot in, in one sense, it's a big burden for canonical to maintain all that stuff. But in the other sense, it's nothing not different than what the GNOME project itself is doing or elementary OS is doing, you know, with potentially a lot less resources. Uh, well, and it seems to be maybe this is kind of becoming the trend is just to create your entire own ecosystem under Linux. Not really. We didn't create everything from scratch. I mean, worth noting that most of the apps that are in that video were created by uh, people in the community. They, they weren't actually created by Canonical. They were The projects were started by Canonical. But pretty much, you know, 80, 90 percent of the code, if not more, in some of those projects was written by community people, volunteers. And they're the people I work with every day. Um, and they're not all written from scratch either. So, for example, you mentioned you happen to mention the two apps which build upon existing okay. uh, frameworks. So, for example, the terminal app yeah. builds on a console I thought plugin, so. the KDE okay. console yeah. plugin. Okay, um, and the file manager builds on some modules that give us the 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 basic file manager functionality. And and on top of that, we built a QML interface. So what you're kind of saying is a lot of this functionality kind of comes for free, and then you have to kind of build maybe something on top of it, in a sense. Right. So it's not like it's yeah, a massive... Yeah, we have to build a QML, right. QML UI on top, yeah. So there really is a potential for Ubuntu to have some pretty good first-class grade applications that are kind of exclusive to the Ubuntu desktop touch platform. Well, they don't, they don't have to be exclusive. Right, right, they're, right. Yeah. Uh, I don't mean they're intentionally all, exclusive. All they're, right, I mean, they're all free software. So, you know, if you wanted to run them on your platform, so long as you've got the necessary dependencies, which for most of them is, you know, have you got Qt 5.3, which is in, you know, Debian and various other distros. I'm sure it's already in Arch. Um, you know, you could probably run most of this stuff. Um, so it's not, it's not intentionally, you know, specific to Ubuntu. Yes, it, ha it uses the Ubuntu look and feel, uses our toolkit, uses our branding, um, and we target Ubuntu as the as the first Right, and, um, but I'm thinking like platform. I'm picturing like 1704, uh, 1810 releases, like the the amount of features, because at that point there will be so many applications that get updated as part of an Ubuntu desktop update. Like looking at where 1410 is at today versus where something like 1810 would be at, 
there is going to be a whole new suite of applications that are shipped in those updates that don't even exist today on the Ubuntu desktop. Right, and those don't have to be created by us. That you know, we've we've created this store where you can upload your own apps. I'll give you a good example. Actually, this week, um, I saw someone tweet about a calculator app for Firefox OS. Yeah. And I found it on GitHub, and I grabbed the code, and I packaged it up. It's an HTML5 app, and I stuck it in the Ubuntu Click Store. And now that's available for people on the phone. And in the future, that'll be available on the desktop. And that took me minutes to take a piece of code that had already been written, turn it into a package. The package consisted of, like, three files, three plain text files that are easy to do. In fact, I copy and pasted them from another one of my projects. <laughs> so it's like it's like near zero effort to take a piece of code that you've created and make it available. And in the future, yeah, we'll have the store that will allow you to deploy um, those click packages to desktop, tablet, so phone. What do you, you know. think about the the fact that like uh, some Linux users will be coming to Ubuntu from a different distro and it's going to be like an entirely, they're going to have, they'll have to learn an entirely different suite of applications. Right. And look how awesome they already are and we're nowhere near ready for those people yet. Right. You know, yeah, I mean I'm not saying it's going to be a bad thing, but it's 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 going to be it's for me it's weird because like right now if I learn, you know, how to how to use like a file manager like say Dolphin or whatever, it's the same Dolphin on all versions of Linux that I install KDE on. It's just going to be a different thing. I'm not saying it's bad or good. It's just something that's new, right. I think. But these are, yeah, but these are default applications. I mean, look what right, uh, yeah, Elementary yeah. are doing with their default applications. They're setting themselves aside and having their own brand, their own style, mm. their own theme to uh, to set themselves aside. They're not they're not necessarily, you know, forking Linux or anything like that. They they they're making um, a statement that this is what elementary OS is. And, you know, when you come to elementary, you get slightly different applications. Okay, the file manager looks like a file manager, and just the same as our file manager looks like a file manager. Um, the music app will have different features, um, maybe more, maybe less. Um, so do you but, think the biggest challenge will be factoring these in a way where they seem a little more native to a desktop interface going forward? Do you think well, like, that's going to be the... I don't think that's the biggest issue. I mean, we're... It's it's one of the issues. We just had the design team haven't focused on yeah. um, the desktop. For, that's why you know Unity Eight isn't finished yet. Unity Eight is a a preview remix CD you can get. It's not it's not the default desktop. You know we, we're not going to make that mistake again. Yeah, I mean I I, I I'm kind of look I'm looking forward to at least trying to get to play around with them a little bit. I, I just think it's well uh, you already can. They're they're all available. They're all free software. You can grab yeah. them and and play with them. Yeah, the the the. The code is all on Launchpad. Uh, we build Debs, so yeah, you can you can install them or you can play with them on a the phone. It's impressive yeah. to see how far they've come already. Really, like uh, I, I've yeah. seen people. I mean, people seem to really not get past the fact that like like oh, you know, I've seen a lot of people complain about the file manager has a huge header bar up top and things like that. Like, mm -hmm. They're obviously not. They're obviously not accepting the fact that they really haven't focused on the desktop UI yet. People right, are, but, and uh, but even on the phone, it has it has that quite big header, and we're looking at. Um, improving that. So next week, as I've mentioned to you before, I'm going to be in Washington. Yeah, I've DC. heard that. DC, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and a bunch of the, the people who wrote those apps that are in that video, a whole bunch of them are coming with us. And we're going to work on all kinds of things, whether it's design or fixing bugs, performance, you know, feedback from, from users. So we're going to look at, you know, comments on those videos, uh, comments on Reddit threads and see what people think of those apps and see what we can do to improve them and how people use them. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an open source project. So you know, yeah, we take feedback and we improve them. And uh, I will have the uh, video that was posted. If you guys are curious, it's a great video and uh, it's up on, uh, it's, we'll have it linked in the show notes. And you can just search YouTube for uh, Ubuntu Next Gen Apps on Ubuntu 14.10 as well. You just search YouTube. And you get to see some of these apps in, in uh, action here. Like, uh, do you know what populates this TV and movies? Uh, what you call it? What'd you call it? Fire yeah, or something? It's the, the, yeah, that, that one's called uh, Flashback. It's Flashback. written by a guy called Necklesh, who's actually the same guy who wrote the clock app uh, that's on our phone. Oh, cool. Um, oh. That's also in that video. Is it doing like a TV DB search here? Because it's like... It he's... uses, uh, I think it's called Tracked. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. Which is oh, yeah. an online yeah. service for tracking the TV programs you like. Yeah. And he he's one of the first... I mean, he's he's blazing a trail because you know, we haven't even... Even written massively convergent apps you know we talk about convergence as this ultimate goal by 1604 right. but he's blazing a trail he's created a convergent app that works on the phone works on a tablet and works on a desktop and adapts itself to the space that's available wow. and you know we're, we're learning from him and he's you know he gave 
so much feedback to the SDK developers at the last summit that we had in Malta. You know, it's it, that's why we have these community people developing apps because it, it helps to further the platform and give us feedback on what we're doing right and what yeah, we're doing wrong. That's really cool to hear that they're having a direct uh, a direct impact like that. Because you know, it's one thing to say communities involved, but that sounds like communities actually. Oh, involved. directly, yeah. yeah, really directly involved. That's pretty. Neat. I'm I'm looking forward to at least getting it. So, uh, in, if I install fourteen ten. Do I just add a PPA and I get those, or how would I get those today if I wanted to play around with some of that stuff? So we have a Core Apps PPA um, that all the devs are built for 14.10. Okay. Um, so yeah, there, if you installed 14.10 uh, and inst- and added the Core Apps PPA, just Google Core Apps PPA, you'll find it. Okay. Um, and they're daily builds of all those all those apps. I think I'm gonna play with that. Cool. All right. Yeah. And and again, keep in mind, like like uh, Popey said, they're not yet fully set up for the desktop, so don't get all right. judgy. It's just for playing. And uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, be- we get a bit twitchy when we see when we see videos. I mean, it's it's yeah. great to see people like Excited, showing off but, what, yeah. what the what the community guys are doing with these apps. But equally, you know, we get a little bit scared because you don't want you know, people we know that we know they're not finished, and uh, right. you know, yeah. I know we, right. people need to be aware of that. Yeah, and uh, and you know if there's one you really like, uh, buy that dev a beer and maybe he'll implement a feature for you if you ask him very nicely. You never know. Or contribute code. Yeah, yeah. Patch is welcome as That's always. Always great too. All right. Well, so I wanted to while we're talking about developing software, I wanted to talk about some uh, speed bumps that uh, the Lightworks developers ran into. You know the uh, the editor that Matt and I talked about quite a bit on last Lightworks. Mm-hmm. They ran into a major issue caused by a Linux kernel update that just sort of blindsided them and took them a while to sort of track it down. And it's just kind of a good snapshot of sometimes some of the problems developers face while writing a major application for Linux and how it happened. It's all kind of interesting, so I'll tell you about that. But first, I want to tell you about Ting. Go to linux.ting.com. Won't you? Linux.ting.com lets them know that you appreciate them supporting Linux Unplugged. And it's a good way to go check them out and get a $25 discount on your first device. And if you already have a device, you can get a $25 credit for Ting. So what is Ting? It's my mobile service provider. It's mobile that makes sense. It's mobile with no contract. It's mobile where you only pay for what you use. Ting doesn't have prepaid plans and and packages like that. It's just your usage. Ting takes your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. They add them up. Whatever bucket you fall into, that's what you pay. It's a flat $6 for your line, so you can have unlimited devices with no contract, and no early termination fee. And Ting has a rockin' dashboard where you can manage your account, get a snapshot of exactly where you at, and they also work on the Android or iOS devices with their app. Plus, they've got no-hold customer service. You call them at one eight five five ting ftw anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. business hours, and an actual human being. A real one. Somebody said, please stop saying an actual Canadian. It makes us feel bad. I'm including everyone on the planet now. I don't know if everyone I don't know if everyone working at Ting is a Canadian or not, but I do have a pretty good suspicion that everyone answering the phone is a human being. I have not personally verified that. But based on the folks I've talked to, they seem quite human to me. So I'm going to vouch for them. And you can find out by calling them at one eight five five ting ftw Find out for yourself. They'll probably answer you and any other questions you have because they're empowered to solve your problems. And now is a great time to switch to Ting. Go to linux.ting.com to get, our, to get the discount and give us credit. They have a warehouse sale. Ting is upgrading their warehouse, and they'd rather give you these devices for a crazy great price than have to move them. Can't say I don't blame them. That sounds like my style of moving. Take nice. it! I don't want it. I don't want to have to move it. You know, I hate moving stuff. Ting feels the same way. Right now, I don't know how, I, I, I can't imagine they're going to have much, many more of these in stock, but you can pick up the Sierra 4G Tri-Band LTE hotspot for $63 with Ting's warehouse sale. $63 plus a $20 wow. Ting credit, and you're going to get our $25 Ting credit. Now, hold on and think about this. You're only paying for what you use with this bad boy. So that's a $6 hotspot because it's $6 for the line, and then that $20 credit's going to last you a while. So you can have a hotspot, tri-band LT, like if I was Popey and I was going to go to that fake Washington, I would pick up one of these just for while I was here, and I wouldn't be able to use the whole thing, and I'd just have my da- I'd have data with me the whole time. Every time I came to the States, I'd turn it on. And when Ting's dashboard, you can turn things on and off when you, when you need them, so it's another great way to save money. They've got a bunch of great devices right now, including just straight-up feature phones. Hey, maybe you just want to make a phone call. I know, right? You want to use your phone to make calls and you just want a really great battery, like a three-day battery life? Well, you can pick up a feature phone right now for a ridiculously low price. $43 plus $20 in TIN credits with no contract and no early termination fee. And you're just paying for your usage. 
for a feature phone that's going to get like three days of battery life. Plus, it still has a decent camera. So like if you get in a car accident and you need something for the insurance, you can still at least take a picture of it. So you're not like a total caveman. But it's mostly going to be for making calls. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If that's how you rock, that's how you rock. I respect that. Linux.ting.com. Linux.ting.com. And a big, big thank you to Ting for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Go check them out. Woo-hoo. All right. So... Now, this isn't going to be a pity party, but I wanted to cover this. I think it's legit that we talk about this. And and this is like, you know, this doesn't have anything to do with packaging. This doesn't have anything to do with Systemd or or anything like that. But uh, Lightworks developer uh, on a Red Shark blog, that's the blog that tracks a Lightworks development, uh, talked about the problems he ran into and the eventual positive side of it by developing for Linux. He says, in recent weeks, some of the Lightworks Linux users started to report reduced performance in both new and old versions of the software. It's like, hmm, multiple versions are affected. After some investigation, it appeared to slow down was only affecting systems with Linux kernels newer than 3.13. In tests, kernel performance in 3.14 did seem to be slightly worse than earlier versions, but nothing could explain the symptoms that were being expo- uh, experienced by Lightworks users. So what could possibly explain this sudden change in behavior? Many of the media files that editors use, you have to kind of understand this part of it, many of the media files that editors use are compressed, like H.264 and stuff like that. Well, these compressed files have a massive downside. And it's something that we try to avoid here at the Jupiter Broadcasting Studios. We actually record in lossless, with the exception of BSD Now, because they're recording it on the east coast of Canada. So we have one show where we, we manage, we, we edit a compressed file. All our other shows are uncompressed. So media f- editors, when they're working with compressed files, have to, do, they have to deal with this thing where there's these gaps in the frames, where the, where, the, where the editor is just supposed to figure out the frame numbers that go in between, and it's just sort of assumed you figure it out. And the, the problem with that is these editors have to open up every single frame in between these gaps to count them all. And that can take megabytes and megabytes and megabytes and megabytes of memory per clip because it has to open them all up into memory to count them to, to figure out the number of frames in between these, these gap markers. And that takes tons of RAM. That's why you need a lot of RAM in an editing system. And so what started happening is when you had tons, tens of hundreds of files open at once, you start running into low memory. Okay, not a problem. That's why we have great memory management. And in in fact, Lightworks handles this by constantly monitoring the system's memory usage, and then it automatically limits and ultimately empties its various caches when it notices the amount of free memory is starting to get low and staying low. This technique relies on being able to ask the operating system, ask the Linux kernel, to report how much memory is available in total, and how much has been used, and how much is available right now to use. Starting with Linux kernel 3.14, free memory is being reported entirely differently. Differently enough that it causes Lightworks software to start believing that there is no free memory left at all when in fact there was. As a result, the memory monitoring code responded as it was designed to by ensuring that all the frames and file caches were completely empty all the time. So as you might imagine, that had a major detrimental performance effect on the Lightworks editor. Every time a frame or file was added to the cache, it was then having to be immediately purged. Well, that could happen you know, 30 times a second, right? Or or oh, 60 yeah. times a second, depending on what you're editing. Uh, so it was forcing this constant recompressing, decompressing of the media file every time you access that area of the file. So they immediately didn't leap to the idea that it was the kernel, though, right? So tracking down the problem became kind of an endeavor because it kind of seemed like the culprit would be probably a piece of their code that wasn't running properly anymore rather than a piece of code in the Linux kernel that was different. That wasn't what they expected, Thankfully, they say once they did track it down to the way 13.4, uh, 3.14 was reporting its memory usage, rectifying the issue was not a majorly time-consuming process, and it actually afforded them an opportunity to rewrite the code in such a way that it made it immune to further possible kernel changes like this in the future. So it sounds like maybe they weren't doing something quite the right way, but at the same time, it sounds like a pretty key piece of the Linux kernel kind of just changed right, from, right, right out from underneath them. That, that You wouldn't think it would happen so suddenly like that, but I've seen, and this is over the course of many years, that sort of thing happen. And it's rare, but when it does, usually it's like a, a real punch to the face. 
Yeah. And uh, usually I see this with wireless devices. Every every three or four years, they just do something stupid with the one device that you depend on. You know, I've learned to have multiple devices. And to see that in something like software in this space to where it's like somebody, can, as a professional, be relying on this application. Oh, hey, by the way, screw you. You're, you're out of luck. Um, through no fault of anyone's, it still sucks. Derek Devlin, is it? Like, is it Lightworks' responsibility that their developers like have an open relations dialogue and relationship with the kernel team? What What are your thoughts? Definitely. Like, one of the things Linus is always talking about is that they won't break user space. So, unless people are saying, "Look, this will break break user space for me," they won't know. So, they will have to break user space, and sometimes it's inevitable. So, in the overall, your algorithm is really bad if it relies on always one functionality and has no fallback of that functionality. So, if I was doing a predictive algorithm, I need to make sure that my prediction works. So, I have to put some heuristics that say, okay, this is changing too fast, I'm going to start using constants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just be a performance hit that it's guaranteed because otherwise the software becomes unreliable. That's, that's kind of design. You make decisions. They made one that was bad. I think so. But kernel Linux isn't this is but this problem has sort of already been solved by the marketplace in a sense. Like if you're a if you're a media production shop and you're working on Hollywood's next uh, blockbuster, chances are you're probably not running Debian Unstable or Fedora, right? Right. And I uh, we, we're in this boat. Uh, we use uh, we use Lightworks professionally and we I, I didn't this is the first time hearing about the problem and probably the reason is cuz the production machine is still on 1204. Right. Yeah, wouldn't that be your best bet? And why not? Because the primary purpose of the machine is nothing to do with what the operating system can do. It's all about running that application. Well, yeah, exactly. For us, it, the machine boots up and Lightworks takes over. And if you've used Lightworks, then you know that Lightworks essentially behaves almost like an independent operating system, right? <laughs> That's a monster. It, it, it essentially <laughs> wow. captures the screen and everything. You have essentially a little desktop to work on. So the, the operating system kind of fades to the background. Yeah. Uh, and and it's exactly why that we have you know obviously the guy that's always talking about Arch and rolling releases. This is exactly the use case for a long term stable distro right here in a nutshell because it it's, it isolates you from these <laughs> kinds of things. Now that said, I still elect for my systems to go rolling. Now if I I'll be the first person to tell you though if our editing was done under Linux, which I wish it were, if it was. I, I think absolutely we'd probably be LTS. We'd probably be Ubuntu because I think that's probably what the Lightworks guys are targeting. And uh, that would be the end of it. And we, I, I would not probably want to upgrade from 12.04 until I had to. Makes sense. Unless there was some kernel feature I had to have or something like that. Uh, but when it comes to like the, this, the systems that I'm browsing the web and gaming on and show research, I, yeah, I want rolling. I think, uh, I think that's, the, I don't know. Daredevil, well, not, oh, go ahead, Matt. No, I, say, I, I was going to say, I think there's inherent logic to that. I mean, it's like, I, I, of course, I'm not using Lightworks on a regular basis. I use other applications for video editing because I'm much lower level stuff. But, you know, if I was to experience that, I think it would definitely kind of uh, jolt my chair a little bit. And it would probably make me reevaluate the distro I'm using almost instantly based on what you described. Oh, man. You know what? Wizard just totally made me reconsider my whole position. Go ahead. Yeah. So I can under totally understand because I do deal with this fairly often. I still deal with my high school sometimes, and the one thing that always changes is I'm updating FFmpeg. Yeah. And FFmpeg yeah. moves so fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, something small, they could say, oh, yeah. well, we just found out we've been wasting CPU cycles here, and there's a 10% increase in speed. Yeah. And, you know, when you're trying to get something quick, like I'm, I'm sure you do, Chris, yeah. then you're going to go and you're going to say, holy jeez, 10%, that's like another five minutes off my time. And yep. Yeah, yeah. In fact, no, I that's, understand. in fact, that's one of the areas where the Mac is kind of handy in, in terms of media production is the user space remains fairly consistent. Uh, they, you know, they trickle out updates to Final Cut. But Rikai, I believe, and I'm not totally positive about this because I'm not really involved with that aspect of it, but I believe Rikai uses something called Brew, which is kind of like app Git for the Mac, and Brew just keeps FFmpeg up to date. So he's always got a fresh FFmpeg, but he's... You know, all his editing tools stay remain remain fairly um, stale or whatever, however you want to put it. And that's Homebrew, a nice combo. Yeah, you're close. Homebrew, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So there you go, and uh, that's a nice system. And so uh, there's ways you can do it on any on any box. You could always like what I used to do on my old when I had an old Ubuntu machine that was my primary driver is I custom built FFmpeg, and that worked too. So there's always an option. Huh. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Well, uh, I, people have asked uh, if there's any updates to Ohio Linux Fest. I, I'll just mention right before we wrap up, it's still on. Uh, it's uh, w- When is that? It's at the end of October. And uh, so far, I believe the crew from Jupiter Broadcasting includes Mr. Kernel Linux and Mr. Q5. And Kernel Linux, you're getting down there Thursday night. Is that right? Well, I might actually, uh, I might actually be there Tuesday or Wednesday. What? Yeah. It's a long story. Okay, okay. I feel bad because I'm not getting there till Friday. Now I kind of wish I was getting there on Thursday. But you should. Uh, uh, it, you know, well, it's kind of it. You know, kids. Did you just feel say bad, he not... should feel bad? Yeah, yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. Okay. So if you're going to be in the area <laughs> on uh, October 24th through the 26th, Jupiter Broadcasting will be rocking. Uh, Colonel Linux will be there. Q5 will be there. Uh, Angela and I will be there. Blaster, of course. Anybody else in the Mumble Room going to be at Ohio? That's it, right? I think that's any. That's just who is here. Uh, and Eric, you're going to be where and when if people want to see you. I am going to be at Siegel, which is the Seattle GNU Linux Conference in, at Seattle Community College. Right, and not Siegel like the bird, right? How do you spell it? It's uh, S E A G L. You can find out more information at Siegel S E A G L dot org. org. Okay, yeah, and uh, that's going on at the same time, right there in Seattle, October twenty fourth and twenty fifth. And uh, so you could go down there if you're in the area and say hi to Eric. And this is uh, their second year? Yes, this is their second year. It's kind of interesting because they've got some big names like Karen Sandler is going to be doing the keynote. And there's quite a few people who will be there, such as Valerie Zimmerman of Kubuntu, as well as Albert Vaca of KDE. So there's wow. quite a few people. Also, uh, Mark Terranova from um, F- the Fedora Project is rumored to be there, so there's going to be quite a few people. Oh man, I think w- so. We're going to have we're going to have double co- double cover co- uh, conference coverage at the same time. So while we're in Ohio, you're going to be in Seattle, and that's going to be that's nuts. That's getting- yeah. The micro- my interview microphone just arrived in the mail, and I just did a quick test on it while we were on the air, and it's sound. I haven't tested the sound, but it's working pretty good. Is that a euphemism for something? I don't know what that... <laughs> testing his mic? Yeah, he's testing know. his mic while on air. I'm not sure what he means by that. All right. Oh, in a separate system. I kept myself muted here. Uh, I'll go, go. Wizard, you know about somebody who's visiting which one? So uh, there's actually going to be another big one at Seneca College in Toronto. And anyway, there's it's going to be fairly big. There's going to be a Red Hat founder there, as well as a couple other pretty important people. In this fact, is I believe the same, the same weekend? Be there too. Yeah, this is the 23rd, I believe. And 23rd, where again? 24th. This is at uh, Seneca College in Toronto. Wow. Wow. Talk yep. about a crazy great weekend and uh, open source uh, going on. That's who and you know what's nuts about that is like then and then a couple of days after that uh, meet BSD down in California, Alan and uh, Chris Moore will be down there uh, held at the Western Digital headquarters put on by uh, IX Systems and they'll be doing live streaming from that. So like I guess this must be this must be fest season and uh, we're getting into it. Absolutely. I guess you got to get it all out of the way before the holidays and before it gets too crappy outside. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. All right. Quickly getting there. (laughs) I think we're all wrapped up. I think we got everything I wanted to cover. Uh, One last uh, just little uh, plea for uh, Linux Action Show is I'm I'm uh, I got some in the queue right now, but I need more of your runs Linux. It could be just like you with a selfie in front of your Linux box. I guess I don't know. It could be your own runs Linux. It could be something you find in the wild. Send it to Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Include like a picture or a link to a YouTube video if you would. And in the subject, put uh, Runs Linux. You can also use the contact form over at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact and put Runs Linux in that subject. And that's also where you'd go to give us any kind of feedback. We love reading your feedback every single episode of Linux Unplugged. It's a big part of our lug. If you can't make it to the Mumble Room, which is an open Mumble Room you can join for any episode. It's our virtual lug. We'd love to hear your thoughts in email. Also, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. You can go there and get more show throughout the week and help us make the show a little bit better by commenting on stuff. I often look to that subreddit to see what you guys are talking about to see what might get some good conversation going in Linux Unplugged. So even just sharing your insights and your votes helps a lot. And, of course, submitting stories and things like that. Matt, this weekend, if all goes as planned, if we get all of our ducks lined up, it's the big Ubuntu review, and it's going to be a blowout like nothing else, including Eric and I are going to be doing traveling and all kinds of things to make this happen. It's going to be a big one. Wow. So I'll see you on Good Sunday, job. okay? All right. See you then. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. Be sure to join us every single Tuesday. And if we don't see you on Tuesday, I hope to see you on Sunday for the big show. See you right back here next week.
just want to punch Comcast in the throat. That's all. I just want to punch him in the throat a little bit. Yeah, so Matt, uh, uh, if you don't have an throw, Ubuntu... Throw four, one from me as well. If you don't have a 1410 machine loaded up, get her going. We'll uh, share our thoughts on Sunday's show and uh, kick Making the tires. I got, uh, I got a rig that I've got it running on right now, and... Uh, I'll tell them, I'll tell everybody more about that on Sunday. I've got show. it running on a rig, not only Ubuntu, but Kubuntu mm -hmm, and Ubuntu mm -hmm. Mate. Ooh, it's gonna be a good hey. one. Uh, so uh, oh go ahead. JBTiles.com is all I was think gonna about say JBTiles. Uh, Ubuntu with the LXQT on there. What about Lu test driving? You pervert. What about Lu? <laughs> Lu Ubuntu? That sounds Lubuntu, like the adult version. The no, no. LXQT one. Fish and chips. Oh, actually, yeah, I think Do you like that fish and chips? Unifying Linux software is not bad. That's good. I want to thank Dunder for Comcast fish and unplugged. chips. He gave me the idea. Comcast unplugged. No kidding. The master <laughs> distribution. Distribution. <laughs> System D ain't so bad. Uh, JB Titles. Hey, Chris. Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, spending a lot of time on the 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 um, those core apps, those QML apps, because the guys work really hard on that, and it's yeah, really nice it, for them I, to get a bit of exposure. I think it shows. Yeah, I thought I thought it showed, and it's it's neat to see it. And I don't know how much we'll since they're not really you know uh, necessarily production ready. I don't think we'll spend too much time on them in the review. So it seemed like sure. a good chance to get a little chance to give them an exposure without working them into a review themselves. Because I don't think they deserve being reviewed. No, no, you no they're not ready yet. Yeah. And following on from last week's discussion, it was a nice bit of positivity. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, you bastards. Positive Ubuntu news. Yay. <laughs> uh, all right, are we going to get a title just, out of this? Ubuntu, but generally. Probably not. You know, well, we got unifying note. Linux software at the top. It's interesting, you know, uh, it was, so it was, a, it was a holiday here in the States Monday, and uh, it's the Apple event on Thursdays, and I think having a holiday at the beginning of the week and an Apple event at the end of the week, the news cycle just goes like a dead fish, like it's just dead, because... A, people weren't working at the beginning of the week, and B, nobody wants anything they announce to be completely clobbered up by whatever Apple craps out on Thursday. So exactly. nothing's going on this week. It's after it Android uh, L as well on Thursday. Yeah, well, I actually thought it was tomorrow. Theoretically. And it's um, mm -hmm. final release for Ubuntu 14.10 as well, final release candidate. Yeah, which obviously eclipses anything Apple or Google it's, do. It's all, it's That's all right. anyone's That's right. going to be talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty. Hey, spe <laughs> yeah. Speaking of both Apple and it's Lightworks, a busy you know what you should do, Chris? You should install Lightworks on your beloved Mac, <laughs> and then you could, uh, and then you could start editing in Lightworks, and then uh, maybe well, at some point down the future, I could pry you pry the. I, would, I have it. No, I have it. Backhanded compliment. I have it right now on my. I have it on my Bonobs right now, actually. <laughs> oh yeah. You should put. Yeah. You, you edited anything on it yet? Uh, I edited our um, a couple of our Oscon. Actually, I edited those. I edited those a while ago. But yeah, I edited a couple of our. Oh, Oscon really? Videos. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I need to give you more credit. I think I think Noah forgot something. I think you should do is put Lightworks on Mac and then play it with HTML5. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, okay. I just I the, the, the way I convert people to. The way I convert people to Linux is I get them using their software that they're comfortable with on the platform, or the yeah, software oh, sure. on the yep. So, so I figure I can baby step Chris away from his uh, Mac and trash. You should, uh, <laughs> Noah. If yeah, you should listen to this week's Coda Radio because Dominic was sure. on me the whole time about that. Uh, and here's wow. the thing: is I think one thing to kind of remember is I don't edit anymore. So. Uh -huh. So yeah, I kind of, kind of a thing. Yeah. So I mean, like, I, for me, that's why I can use Lightworks now because the editing I do is much. Wait, so you don't use a Mac anymore. You pay someone else to yeah, use a Mac yes. for you. <laughs> yes. 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 Well, but you know what? So okay. Here's the that. thing. He pr he bought the Mac and set it in front of him and said, "Here's the editing rig you're going to use." Well, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's yeah. But that's you know, we've had we've it's had this we've it's had this conversation a few times. Uh, I I will stand by the claim that the tools are not just like. If, boy, it's just a lot easier. No, it's more like the, the tools yeah, Chris, are like... you should stop like, using Skype as well. The years <laughs> ahead. <right? laughs> Here's the thing. I, I don't have, I don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to live production, but as far as editing goes, uh, I think if you're willing to change your workflow a little bit, you could get away with doing it. Probably. Probably.